Hello and welcome to Alta Live. I am so happy to welcome all of you joining today's discussion with poet Matthew Zapruder. As you fill in, please do let us know where you're zooming in from. It is always nice to see the geography of our community. Um, so welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Beth Spotswood, I'm Alta's digital editor, and you are here for today's conversation with poet educator, incredibly nice person, Matthew Zapruder, moderated by author Steve Amond. A little bit about today's guests. Matthew is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Father's Day, as well as two books of prose, Why Poetry, and the book I think we're going to talk mostly about today, Story of a Poem. He is the editor at large of Wave Books, where he edits contemporary poetry, prose, and translations. He's held the annual rotating position of editor of the poetry column for the New York Times Magazine and was the editor of Best American Poetry 2022. He teaches the MFA in Creative Writing Program at St. Mary's is a contributor to Alta Journal. And in fact, you can read Sunflower Poem, um, a recent one that is in here, our current issue right now, the survival issue. Steve Amond is not only a friend of Matthew, but the author of 12 books of fiction and nonfiction. His recent books include William Stoner and the Battle for Inner Life, which is about reading and writing and the struggle to pay attention to our lives, and Bad Stories, a literary investigation of the 2016 election. Most recently, Steve's novel, All the Secrets of the World, was released last year. Before I turn it over to Steve, some brief housekeeping. Alta Live, if you've never been before, is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, surprise, here's a sneak peek at our brand new issue, issue 24. We are a quarterly focused on California and the West. Um, we've got a website, we do incredible events, weekly events like Alta Live, the monthly California Book Club. In fact, next month, we're excited to welcome Wa Su and his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Stay True. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Alta and the work we do, I so hope that this event will inspire you to check us out some more. Um, hi, Marina, California, Potomac, Pendleton. Thank you all for joining us. Um, there were, Steve and Matthew will chat for about 30 minutes, and then I will come back with questions on your behalf. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Krakow, Poland, wow. Um, so please ask your questions for Matthew there. Um, this interview will be recorded, emailed to all of you, posted to altaonline.com. And with that, I'm excited to tune in and listen like the rest of you. So I will turn this over to Steve. Thanks, Beth. Um, it's super awesome to have people telling us where they're from. Um, and, and I also want to urge people like Matthew and I are old pals and we will talk more or less indefinitely. We'll just talk all day and night. But um, I would love it if you're listening and you hear something that you want to ask Matthew about or even just want to respond or reflect on. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So I would love it if you would participate in the conversation in that way. Um, sort of greedily want to ask Matthew a bunch of questions, all of which are going to be long and convoluted, but I'll do my best to kind of edit them down. Um, but I really would love it if you guys um, want to respond in any way. I'll keep an eye on the chat. That would be just awesome. And thank you for being here wherever you are. So this new book, Matthew, I'm going to cavell a little bit, is like I saw it in many iterations, many drafts, and I um, read it and then now have reread it and, and was just kind of startled at... Um, how good it is. I mean, I know from reading why poetry and your poems, the, the kind of mind you have and the kind of attention you bring to your work and just the beauty of your language. But I, I think this is my favorite of your books because um, I feel it's so simple and direct with the reader. And it was like listening to a great teacher, which I think you are, though I've never been in one of your classes. I just have a sense that you are like a great teacher or almost like a rabbi where there's a, as you read, there's a constant process of demystification happening where I found myself saying over and over again, oh yes, that's exactly how it is. I just never found the language for it. And I wanna say thank you for that. And also urge everybody who already, who, if, even if you have a copy of this book, like buy another copy to give to a writer person or just a parent person or just a person person in your life because it's such a, a gift of a book. 
And I know that you struggled with structure because we talked a little bit about that. And you write in the book about, um, and I love this part of the book. This is what I mean by how simple and direct and open it is. You write, I tried so many times to write the beginning of this book to explain what I was doing, why I was writing this one poem, sharing its drafts, telling the story of how I got here. It never felt right. The tone was always too obscure or impersonal or melodramatic or self-absorbed, which is our thoughts I've had several thousand times as I work on each of my books. But what amazed me, Matthew, is that you settled on such a, a, an, a remarkable uh, kind of traditional way of starting the story, which is you start once upon a time and you write simply and directly about your own evolution as an artist in the third person, how you established a writing practice and fell in love and married your wife, Sarah, and had a child, Simon, and realized that Simon was neurodiverse. It's an, an, a startling act of narration, just which I am always yammering on about as a writing teacher, because I think it's the great gift of literature that modern writers have lost track of to be a good guide to the reader in the collaboration of, of reading a book. How did you like settle on this approach, which is in obvious in its obviousness? Hmm. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, you, I mean, you saw the book, as you said, in a lot of different versions, and I don't, I, you probably saw different versions of that. You get preface too. I mean, I knew that I needed to explain what I was going to do because it's a kind of book where I talk about things, but I'm also doing something in the book, which is sort of writing these writing through these drafts of the poems. And I, I, I tried without any introduction or preface, and it was just really confusing to just drop into that. Like, why is he doing this? Like, why are these, you know? So, so I was like, okay, well, I need something there, and I like I tried everything. Um, and it just was awful and just getting worse. And I, I probably have 50 drafts of this preface on my, you know, on my, on my hard drive or whatever. And so I was thinking actually about you because I have seen you taught lecture more than once about this idea of the narrator and like how in our, in, in sort of the most contemporary version of our storytelling having to do, I mean, you can explain it better than me, but as I understand it, having to do somewhat with technology and with other factors, we've sort of lost the idea of a guide through a story. We sort of would drop people into stories. Um, and, you know, that works well in a first person shooter or maybe like a, you know, a blockbuster Marvel movie, you know, action, 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 action. There's no exposition is necessary, but, you know, you, you, you've spoken and written so eloquently about what we've lost by not having a uh, sort of a self-conscious and announced guide through stories. And so I was thinking about that and I was like, well, how could I do that? Like, 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 how could I do that in a way that felt authentic to me? And then also I was thinking about, I had seen a, a talk that a friend of mine named Rachel Howard, who's a, who's a wonderful writer gave, and she said something a lot, kind of a, almost as an aside, which is that she heard once that all stories begin with once upon a time whether it's said or not, it's articulated or not, that that's how all stories begin, once upon a time. And so I thought, I just out of total desperation, I just wrote down once upon a time, like, da, 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 da. you know, like, what am I going to do? And then after that, what happened is this third person description emerged. And I'm not sure why I didn't get the idea consciously from anywhere, but it just, and then I it poured out of me, the whole story just poured out of me. And I was thinking the whole time, God, this is a little too easy. You know, like, like, wait a second, like, this is, seems almost too, I didn't trust it, you know, obviously I had to go back and work a lot on it, but that's, that's sort of what happened. And I don't know why, I don't know why, but I think you could probably explain better than I can why, because I don't, I'm not a really a prose writer. I don't, I don't, I have never told stories professionally like that. So I didn't know anything about it. I did. And so I stumbled on this solution, but it was, but your, your ideas about the narrator were definitely a huge part of what was going on for me, you know? Well, it reminded me a little bit of the opening, the first chapter, it's, I guess, the preface of Slaughterhouse-Five, which is Kurt Vonnegut's most famous mm -hmm. book, where it's basically a kind of confession of how hard it is to tell the story, and then doing what I think a great narrator does, which is to assume that the audience is an audience of strangers, and your first job is to turn and face the audience and say, here's who I am, here's the nature of how I got to this project that I want to share with you, and I, I want people in the in the chat to admit, or the Q&A, wherever you want to put it, if you have ever, out of anxiety that, that the reader is going to get bored, or not, not going to be entertained enough, or that you're not eloquent, or wise, or 
a beautiful enough writer to keep them entertained, they'll wander off to Netflix. If you've ever jumped into a story, jumped into scene without orienting the reader, because part of your mission, I think, which I've never seen another writer do it at the level you do, is to engage productively with bewilderment. And by that, I mean, you're, you're trying to solve like really deep or not solve, but address and experience really deep mysteries. What does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to try to make poems? What does it mean to have an atypical child? All this stuff and, and, and the strain that puts on marriage and your own ideas of identity, all that stuff is the bewildering, the, the bewilderment that you're engaging productively with in this book. I find myself and, and other writers Basically, the bewilderment that we trap the reader in is what's happening? Where am I? Who am I with? What do they want? And so I feel like that the this solution that you've come to is absolutely essential to just speak so plainly and generously. And it's actually continued all throughout the book, even though the nature of the project kind of shifts and you start sharing these drafts of poems. I go to poetry readings a fair amount and I know this is going to be a terrible thing to say, but like I like almost sometimes more than the poems, the discussion of where the poems came from. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's sort of like an illicit um, or, or that could be read as like being down on the poems themselves. But sometimes I find when when the speaker is really generous with me and simple and direct, I kind of get a window into how their creative process works and where the poem really came from. And that's exactly what you do in this book, you share all these drafts really generously. And you you describe kind of the overarching frame is this phrase that Lorca throws out in this great talk on the poetic imagination. He says, the mechanics of the poetic imagination are always the same, a concentration, a leap, a flight, a return with treasure, and a classification and selection of what has been brought back. And that, Matthew, is what I experienced so powerfully in reading the drafts of your poems, watching you leap and the flight you were taking and the process you go through of what to cast aside and what treasures to keep. Um, and I just want to say that that, that that it was such a beautiful way to frame what you were up to. I mean, I'm sure your unconscious was making all those decisions, but it was so pleasurable to realize, oh, he's doing what Lorca exactly he is yeah. he is revealing to the reader exactly the mechanics of that poetic imagination no that was that that was where that was one of the places the book began is that idea well can i can i slow down and sort of show all the aspects of it because i think like you know you you know the that description of the way the poetic imagination works we spend a lot of time in workshops talking about the classification and selection part of it, which makes sense because that's what we, the evidence we have in front of us is like, hey, this is how things have been arranged. And why don't you, what would happen if you move this here or did that differently? That's the classification and selection. But what about the gathering? But there's also a fair amount of talk about the first stage, which is the concentration. Like right. how do you get to the page? Like, what do you do? That's also a very useful conversation. But what about that middle part? What's happening when you're in the, in that gathering imaginative, like what's going on there? It's very difficult to talk about. Um, and I realized, you know, you can't really talk about it. You have to show it. And and my version of it is going to be different from other people's, obviously. And maybe there'll be overlaps, but you know, I I I am not trying to contend that obviously that my way is the only way. But 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 um yeah, I was excited by the idea of just trying to open it up and see what happened if I if I put it down the page. And you know, and as far as you know, talking about situating people or you know, kind of being with the reader and like you're feeling that in poetry reading sometimes the description of the poem is more interesting than the poem itself. I think I've been, you know, I've been reading a lot of Charles Simic lately. Um, he passed away recently. He's a great, great poet originally from Serbia. And it's, um, and what I've noticed is, is that in all of his poems, you immediately know where, kind of like where you are. And I mean, by where you are, I mean, sort of not even just like literally, like, are you sitting in a chair? Are you... Been, but like sort of where you are in the world kind of. And that there's, there's a way that great poets can situate a reader instantly and do that work you're talking about, about that thing about, oh, I was sitting here and I was having this thought. They kind of do that in the poem without breaking the spell. And that's a tough thing to do. It's different from writing prose. Prose, you, it doesn't work quite the same way. And I think part of my mistake in the beginning was kind of trying to write this book like it was a poem. You know, which it isn't, obviously. And so, you know, so, I mean, even though I knew that, it was just, it was just, 
you know, formally, there were a lot of interesting challenges. Yeah. So, so, but the work I recommend that the, the, the lecture, uh, last thing I'll say is that lecture that um, Steve mentioned is called um, Imagination, Inspiration, Evasion, and it's by Garcia Lorca. And you can Google it and find it um, on the internet. And it's, it's, a, it's an incredible piece of writing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And, and I loved the generosity, both with how many different poets you quote and how usefully, and thinkers and writers, and how usefully you do that. It's like, look, I don't need to try to coin the particular phrase or find the language. Somebody else has described exactly the insight that is the most useful in this moment. So like your book is is littered, you know, littered with those. My impulse narcissistically sometimes to be like, well, I'll say it better, I'll say it different. And you're like, no, you know, <laughs> Simic said it, Susan Sontag said it, she said it perfectly, or Audre Lorde or whoever it is. Um, you talked about, kind of the, the the process of creation itself. And what I was struck by in the book is how much you're able to capture the essential um, a, a ingredient to create, you know, creating anything, I think, which is somehow slowing down and arresting your attention in the midst of distraction. Um, that's the way Saul Bellow put it, like art has something to do with arresting your attention in the midst of distraction. And you, in the book, point to a couple of things that actually help you do that, which I, I, I would like you to talk about. One is using uh, your mom's Royal Quiet Deluxe typewriter, which literally caused you to have to slow down your process. But the other is, is sort of more implicit and, and quite powerful, which is watching Simon, your son, um, acquire language and learn the steps by which you um, you know, you acquire language and, and you're able to, through, through watching that process, it, it felt to me like recognize that trying to be sort of fluid and speedy through the language wasn't the way that, that the, the best way for you to make poems or even understand, you know, your own experience. Mm -hmm. We could talk a little bit about those two things. Yeah, um, well, that is a great question because I think you've hit on, you know, the the two sort of concrete like actual like things that helped me change my own habits of mind i guess as i would say you know so um just to back up a second you know what bello says echoes i mean i'm not i studied literary theory as a graduate student in a previous life um and i found almost all of it useless sometimes interesting but it didn't really help me but there were a few concepts that did, and one which did has always helped me is, is the Russian theorist Viktor Shklovsky's idea of defamiliarization, which should be pretty familiar to a lot of people. Defamiliarization um, is just essentially an idea that art's job is to impede our habits of perception. It slows it down, it, it, it junks things up, whatever you want to say. And so, you know, he has this quote where he says, uh, art makes the stone stony. Or he says a dance is a walk made strange, because because actually the the the, the literal translation of of, of defamiliarization is in, in Russian it's astranenya, which is making strange. So so I think you know that's an idea, but then how do you do that? And I think I was fortunate enough to kind of by accident stumble across literally like stumble across my mom's typewriter when we were moving it out of my grandfather's house. And that made me, I was using a computer to write early on and it was too much, it was too fast, changing things too fast. So just using the typewriter and typing out drafts over and over again was that physically made me just put a barrier. You know, I couldn't do that thing anymore of like moving everything around. And yeah, and watching my son, you know, that's just been another example of that. I mean, it's incredibly inspiring and awesome and cool and fun to like watch him acquire language. You know, it's so wonderful every time he can do something new, but it's slower. It's way slower than for a neurotypical person. So you see, you see the gears turning, you see, you watch him figure stuff out. And for someone like you or me, who like absolutely adores words and language, it's just the most, I mean, it's fast. I mean, if you don't get past like the worry about it, it's incredibly fascinating. It's really interesting. And he's, he's a bright little dude and he's just, you know, he's, he's working it out and it's great to see. So yeah. So it inspires me to slow myself down too, for sure. He, he also, part of what's uh, amazing about the book is your, just your active attention to your own experience of fatherhood, but also to just Simon himself. And there's this beautiful place where you write this. You say there was a place he could go in his mind that was so real 
it was impossible to resist, an immersion so total and deep, it was impossible to reach him there in his absorption and pleasure. Um, and I thought, well, what a reminder of not the state that you always get to, but at least the state that you're aspiring to when mm -hmm. you're trying to write. Right. Yeah, it's so interesting to watch, to watch him do something that, in a way, like you said, it's almost like a... Um, like the highest form of immersion that we might that we might hope for in our own um, in our own you know life for readers and writers. I saw somebody in the chat say, "I'm a reader, not a writer." You know that in a way, like they're the same in, in many ways, or there's an overlap in many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, I mean, I don't want to generalize about neurodiverse people or autistic people in any way. You can't do that, but there is a way that that you know. I think we. We're me, me, neurotypical people are often extremely uh, externally oriented, right? And I think that, you know, people, you know, I've met a lot of people on, who are autistic and they, um, and they, you know, um, are um, more, you know, they find a relief a lot of the time in their own mind and in their own, and in their own perception. So, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's definitely the case. And again, I'm re reluctant to, to, um, to you know generalize in any way but yeah that's 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 for sure true and um but there's also a pleasure in coming out of that space too that i see you know yeah you write about basically sort of trying to and i i love this idea um you say um so many things toward the end of the book so many things happen to a person and i'm i'm quoting matthew not to embarrass you but i want people to be able who who don't know the book to just be able to hear how deeply you're thinking about things and how precisely you're expressing things that I think have occurred to me, or at least I've tried, have some inchoate sense of it, but have never had language for it. So here's how you write about kind of the, the creative process for poets in particular. So many things happen to a person, are thought and said, and only some of them glow. Something glows off the page or out of life, and it is taken into the poem. The challenge for each poet each time is finding the structure of poems that can further activate and extend these private intuitions of significance into some kind of tentatively collective realm. The poems are where the transition from private emotion into public myth, from idiosyncratic into the collective symbol is made and vice versa. I think that's something about trying to take what is really very private in the inner life and I think your mission is with this book and with all your poems uh, to make something that's a very, in this case, a very private creative process, like public, <laughs> make it discernible and uh, for the reader. Yeah, I mean, what is that impulse in, 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 in writers? I don't know, is to take what's inside and make it and bring it outside. Maybe all human beings have that impulse, um, you know, but I think, um, you know, I think that it's it's particularly uh you know I, yeah and I'm, I'm just driven to kind of like make a connection i guess i don't know i i, I it's, i'm not really sure why i think i've always just wanted that to just make a make a connection and I, the way that i can do it is through writing you know and so yeah to bring the inside out is 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 and then then of course you know i don't want to overdo it but there's there's a there's a there's a congruence there but with my own son's experience you know his 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 own negotiation of the inner world and the outer world. And, you know, I mean, I think you write about that all the time. I mean, that's what Stoner's about. That's what, you know, all the secrets of the world is about. You know, that's what, you know, it's, it's you're, you're this, I'm in the middle of reading your new craft book, a draft of you, the craft book. That's what that book is about. Like, how do you bring that out? And where do you find the commonalities that feel authentic? Like the overlaps right. that feel real. And then also like, what what good does that do? And I think it does do good to bring us together in that way, you know, to bring people together in that way and to cross over, I guess, is the way that I put it. You know? Yeah, it's interesting because you also, I think, really smartly write books and poems in correspondence with other writers. One of the things that um, you, you, you've, you write in the book and, and you, you've mentioned, you know, in interviews and in our conversations is that when you, you write poems to other poets, and in this book really began, or at least some of its origins can be traced to writing to another writer, really not even poems, just uh, it sounds like sort of dispatches from your life, explaining to each other, bearing witness, and having that ideal reader who's patient, 
and thoughtful and interested in what you're saying, but also knows nothing about your life. I think it's part of the reason that you're so so gentle and such a good guide to the reader. Can you talk a little bit about, because people have this idea of like, you go off to your Warren and you sort of, you know, sort of disappear up your own ass and kind of create the art. But I think your, your model of creation is much more to be in conversation with somebody. Yeah, well, it comes back to to why, you know, why, why, I mean, I don't think that, I don't think I was ever driven as a writer really by the urge to like, sort of, um, I don't know, like just, just tell people things. I think I wanted to, I think I wanted to interact or connect I mean, maybe just being a lonely kid. I don't know is where it comes from. I'm not really sure, but, uh, but, you know, just to, yeah, reach out, go move across. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's hard to say like where those motivations really come from deep down, but it's, it is, it is central to what I do. And, and I think I'm always aware of a listener of some kind. And I also, you're, you're also talking about like the email. It's funny. My wife was just making lunch and I had, I settled down in the kitchen here and Sarah was making lunch here. So it's like, there's always a lot going on and, you know, and it's, 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 <laughs> Um, and you can you know you can get you can resist it or you can just embrace it. And I I think it's funny. It's a very different kind of writer. But um, I think a lot about Frank O'Hara. And I remember hearing early on about O'Hara and how he used to write. He has to have a typewriter set up and write in the middle of parties. You know, and you could feel you could when you write his poems, you could feel life coursing through and everyday life and and nowness coursing through the poems. And I, I just. You know, I, I think I just resonated so strong with that, even though we couldn't, we couldn't be more different, me and Frank O'Hara anyways, but like, but you know, but so I think, you know, me, I, I like to write in the middle of life. Of course, I need time to process and, and, and you know, like think and meditate or whatever, but like, yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I, I love that about poetry. I love that about writing in general, you know, so, yeah. It, yeah. There, I think there's a, a reference to Frank O'Hara in in a part of the book where you're talking about I love poems that have people's names in them. Yeah. Um, you, right. Yeah. Yeah. Frank. Frank. He says he says in one of his great poems, uh, um, a true account of talking to the son of Fire Island. He has the 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 son make a pun. He says, "Frankly, you know, I'm I'm you know happy to see you or whatever you know like, you know." So I yeah, and I love that he puts his own name in. But yeah, there's there's always yeah, I love poems that have names in them. I don't know why. It's just like it's very like. It's sweet, I think, you know, and it's and it's and it's also just like you get this sense of intimacy right there. And like you're like you're overhearing, but you're also participating. And then you're also you're having your own congruent feeling of like that intimacy that you have with someone else, you know. Yeah, yeah I love that. And, like, and it's thrilling in, in a way because the book in this first section is be, because you're trying to set out a lot of your own story and you want to get far enough away from yourself to be kind of detached and say, you know, the, this is what this guy was up to. And, you know, then he, you know, he met, a, he, he start, went to San Francisco and, you know, was in punk rock bands and tried to write poetry and dyed his hair and met these poets. And you're kind of having to report in a way that makes you a character. And what's part of what's thrilling about this book that I've, I've not seen in another book is this narrative stance is so supple that you can shift from that kind of detached objective view of yourself you were talking about sort of the chaos. You can hear a ding as my wife is sending messages that I cannot return <laughs> at the moment. But um, it shifts from that detached point of view to this incredibly intimate, personal, first-person account of your of, of your parenting, of living in California in the midst of the the, the wildfires and kind of the the, the coming um, climate apocalypse. Um, and and really also just the defamiliarization of having a child, a neurodivergent uh, child that that causes you to sort of knocks you off of the high achieving track um, or like the idea that your job is to the way you put it is to become a um, to become a highly valued product, go to the right school, study everything um, and that your own life was sort of defamiliarized. Um, by having a child who who simply engages the world very differently than you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all all the you know, but I mean, I think it helped that I wrote the. Um, I think it helped that I wrote that more intimate first person part first, and then came back into the third person. I think that that yep. sort of, even though obviously it comes the opposite way chronologically in the book, it's just it's just. Um, I think I just I, I felt both the strengths and limitations of that intimacy of the first person. I guess. You know, and again, I feel like I'm discovering things that you would learn in your first week in an MFA program in fiction. 
you know, or nonfiction. Like, I'm just like, oh, it's, you have to sometimes write in scene, right? Like, I was like, I was like, why is my book so boring? Like early versions I sent you, I was like, why is this so boring? And then I read my friend Emily Black's book, Emily Rapp Black's book, um, Frida Kahlo on My Left Leg, which is an amazing book. And I was like, why is this so good? And I was like, oh, because a lot of it's in scene. I was like, oh, right. I got to write in scene. You right. Know? We so I, like, I learned things that you would that you've known for 30 years. Like I just figured it out, like through through, you know, messing it up kind of, you know, yeah. it's really funny. We try not to tell the poets too much because then they just end up being better prose writers than we are. That's, that's, <laughs> I don't know about that, the, but 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 it was really funny how rudimentary I ha, you know had to be, you know. So yeah. Anyway. Well, li listen. Let's. Um, we could go on and on, but I want to welcome Beth back into the conversation. I know there are people who have questions from the chat and from you know previous emails, and they're eager to hear Matthew's thoughts on their their particular bewilderments. You both are fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, that was just a really exciting conversation and I know our audience agrees. I'm going to pop in with some, some audience questions now. Bradley asks, just going back to the type, your mom's typewriter, have you used the typewriter for all of it? And can you also just tell us a little bit about like what your literal work process is like? Like, do you have a, your workspace? What is your workspace like? Is it on the road? Is it always at this, in your office at your mom's typewriter? Um, I, I do use the typewriter sometimes. I don't use it all the time. I mean, I kind of use it at different stages of the process, you know, and I use it when I'm particularly kind of like, um, uh, you know, sort of, I'm going to get up and move because somebody is making a lot of noise. Um, I, uh, I um, use it when I'm in a particular like kind of moment in the process that's similar to what I describe in the book, you know, that's like, that's like, you know, if I feel like I'm moving too fast or something isn't working, then I'll, then I'll sort of, um, you know, just back up to the typewriter and be like, okay, we're doing this at this stage of the draft. And, and sometimes I'll start, start with the draft on the typewriter, you know, but yeah, I still have it. I have a bunch of typewriters that my wife says no more typewriters allowed. Uh, I can't buy anymore, but um, I sort of rescue them like animal, like rescue animals, you know. I have Isn't a lot of whole subculture, the typewriter people. The well, people it is. And I didn't know that. I talk about that in the book. I didn't know like what a kind of like, I don't want to say cheese ball, but kind of like writerly cliche that was the typewriter. I just had no idea. I, I, was, I inherited this typewriter. Um, my writing space, I share an office with my wife. She's a, she's a heavy hitter. She's a, she's an urban planner and a really like, she's a great, like, you know, professional person, also a writer and just like really, so she's super busy. So she's in there a lot and working a lot. So you know, I go in there and work a bit, but, you know, I work all over the house. I work up at school. I work in the car. I work wherever I can, you know, so it's not, I, I don't, I don't have, I'm not one of those people who has like a really solid, like ritualistic writing practice. I always write down at the beginning of every summer, develop ritual, you know, like on my, <laughs> on my, on my notes and then like never happens, you know, it's like the ritual apparently is me picking up my kid from camp and dropping him off at other places. So, yeah, so I do, I catch as catch can, you know. And and I, it was easier when I didn't have as many responsibilities. But yeah, um, yeah. but also life is more full and better now, so it's okay. It's just, but it's yeah, it was easier to have a very uh, you know anal retentive writing process when there were there were no kids around. You know, <laughs> so as I'm sure we can all identify with. Um, Gwatham asks he they love your thunder pink thunder, and we're wondering um, if you're planning to come up with anything like it. Um, how do you feel about recent poets, songwriters like James Tate, David Berman, Simic? So that's my brother's project. It's called Pink Thunder. He did it. He did it many years ago. It's an incredible like song cycle collection that's of songs, contemporary songs based on poems. My brother's a composer and a musician. I have a younger brother and a sister who are twins, and they're both writers and artists. My sister. What's your brother's first name? Michael. And, uh, and so, for. but, but he, but he did those, he did this kind of like these leader, basically, uh, that's German word, song, song, song poems, um, amazing stuff. So yeah, the project is called Pink Thunder. It's great. I think you can see it on Bandcamp if you Google it. So yeah, I mean, Berman was one of the greats, you know, huge loss. My friend Joe Pernice, also a poet and a, and a, and a, and a, and a right. But like, yeah, I mean, songs and poetry, that's a whole different conversation we could have some other time. Songs and poetry are different different animals to me um i'm a music you know i play music and i'm i'm not much of a songwriter i've written a few songs but i'm just not it's a different i think it's a different thing writing lyrics and at my my poems i've been lucky enough to have two incredible composers put my work to to music missy mazzoli who's has 
who's an unbelievable composer, the first woman to have a, um, a project commissioned by the Met. Um, she's doing an opera of George Saunders, Lincoln and the Bardo. Um, and she's amazing. And she did, she did an opera that was based on, on poems of mine and also Gabriel Kahane, who's unbelievable and has set a bunch of my poems to music. And also at the end of this book, there's a, there's a longer poem called Final Privacy Song that, that was a commission that he gave and then he set that poem to music. So I've worked with a lot of musicians and, but, but so yeah, it's an interesting crossover overlap order, but there are different things I would say. I think we're, we're just about out of time. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of combine two questions in one for your last one, Matthew, if that's okay. Um, Christy asks, do you think artists are born and, um, or become, or become artists, I think through self-discovery and self-development and also via email, when did you discover that poetry, how old were you or kind of what age range were you when you discovered that poetry was your, your medium? Well, I want, I'd love to hear Steve's answer to this question too, about artists being born or made. I mean, I think, I guess that I think that people who have the urge to make something and maybe everybody has the urge to make things, I don't know, are, they find themselves gravitating towards different materials. You know, I mean, maybe whether it's, you know, people love cameras or they, or they love wood and they, or they love, you know, musical instruments or they love, you know, paint or whatever. And a lot of it is, is just almost like sensory. Like people like the smell of paint, you know, or they like just being in an artist studio, you know, things like that or whatever. And I think writers, I mean, not to be silly about it, but I think writers love words. I think they just dig words and they just, they, they just, you know, geek out on it. And Steve and I have had long conversations about just language you know words and 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 i think that's what draws someone to being a writer you know it's just that that's their that's the thing that they that they dig that's the texture of life that they get off on you know and it's like um and so yeah i mean i would say you know the typewriters is kind of a physical manifestation of that of that fetishization of language you know it's like i love typewriters and i love them because they're because they they have letters on them you know and that's just my thing you know uh, so I think born and made, I would say. And then there's a lot of training that comes after it. I don't know, Steve, do you have any thoughts about that or, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. The, whenever I hear the word artist or writer, I get a little like imposter syndrome, bullshit detector, like fl flare goes off because I think okay. people are kind of like the nature of having these big brains that are riven by guilt and primal urges and the awareness that we're going to die and like all this, like, and the people around us are vulnerable and we're vulnerable, like we're just a mess. And so I think we have to do a number of things. I mean, that was all necessary to survive, but now we're left with this vestigial giant brain. And I think it, part of the way that we deal with our uncertainty and doubt and our dark primal feelings, in addition to having a sense of humor, is that we kind of try to make things. And then we've got this special idea, which is part of that merit meritocratic machine that you talk about in your book, Matthew, you know, that sort of at some point, if you do it well enough, or you have the right pedigree, or people pay for your stuff, you become an artist or a writer. And it's just nonsense. It's kind of like a big spectrum. Human beings are constantly creating all the time. You, you're in the presence of any child. You understand everybody's making things all the time. Mm -hmm. They're making decisions, basically, about what will look good or feel good or sound good. And we should focus on the verbs, you know, the, the, the act of creation. I think of myself as like, I'm a word decider and a syntax decider and a character decider, not like a writer. That's that's too big, vague, pretentious a term. Um, but I will say that what I really think is exciting, Matthew, in, in this book is like, and, and, and why poetry as well, like I love when somebody who's really, really good in one genre and could just stick with that and ride that horse forever says, actually, I want to try to express myself <laughs> in another way. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I had my horrible experiments with other other kinds of genres like poetry. And they were completely, you know, I just needed to not mess in that particular um, kennel. But it's really exciting to see when when somebody who's such an adept writer in one form says, I actually want to try to communicate and share with the reader and create um, in this whole new in this new way of communicating. And you don't need any training for that. Quite obviously, an MFA program wouldn't do you any good. <laughs> It'd probably do you some damage. So. Yeah, I definitely uh, have no plans to write a novel. I can tell you that. That's that's where I draw the line, Steve. I'm gonna leave Yet. that to the professionals. Yet, no, no, I'm gonna leave that to you, man. That's that's that's. I love reading them. I love them, and but that's that's for other people. So, 
but yeah, but I just thank you for this conversation. Thanks for everybody, um, you know, for your stuff in the chat. I've been reading it. I couldn't really respond at the same time, but, um, but Steve, you're the best. And, and, you know, thanks for the amazing questions and, you know, and thanks everybody for dropping into our ongoing conversation. And thanks to you, Beth and Alta, Alta rules. I love yeah. So. We are thank such you. fans, such fans. Thank you so much, both of you for taking time out of your very, very busy schedules, both as writers you really are writers and as dads i know you're both very very busy dads so thank you so much um folks before you go i do want to invite you next week we're going to have a conversation alta live is is having a conversation on our latest alta serial about the applegate trail if you played oregon trail as a child or are just interested in history or both um come join us for that it's really it's going to be a fascinating conversation um and and again check us out on altaonline.com um so grateful matthew zapruder steve almond everyone for coming. Stay safe um, and be well. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.